Hi, this is Bruce Becker, the architect and developer of Hotel Marcel in New Haven, Connecticut, and you are listening to U.S. Modernist Radio. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what mama don't allow, gonna draw my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. I'm Tom Guile. 3D printing has arrived for home construction. Today, we'll meet Melody Yashar. She's VP for Building Design and Performance at ICON, a firm devoted to developing advanced construction. Their neighborhood of 3D printed houses, designed by Bjarke Ingels, went on sale in Austin, Texas this past June. Later on, we'll talk with German director Jan schmidt Gare, whose latest film is The Promise, architect B.V. Doshi, an intimate portrait of the late Indian architect's life and work. Before that, however, we'll check in with Kyle Bergman, founder of the New York Architecture and Design Film Festival, with this year's October lineup. And now, the guy who makes elderly architects a little nervous. Here's Mr. Modernism, George Smart. Hey, thanks, Tom. One of the greatest pleasures of working at U.S. Modernist are the conversations I have with older architects, the men and women central to the mid-century modern movement. They are almost all gone. In the last 17 years, I've probably spoken with over 150 people over 80 and as old as 103. Long retired... They are more than happy to talk about past projects and the fascinating people they studied with, worked with, and quarreled with over the decades. They have lots to say, and they are pretty sharp. A few may not be able to tell you their daughter's name, but they can all recount every client who pissed them off, (laughs) every builder who changed their design, and every slight they felt when awards time came around. On our North Carolina archive, ncmodernist.org, we have over 40 interviews with the state's classic architects, many on video. Sadly, a number died within a few months of our conversations. And these architects would call each other and jokingly ask, did that George Smart talk to you yet? You better check your life insurance. (laughs) At ncmodernist.org, there are extensive profiles on over 300 architects, an unrivaled archive of their residential work going back 100 years. If you're considering moving here to North Carolina, and who isn't, browsing the archives is a great way to find houses you might want to buy or get a sense of the neighborhoods where there are concentrations of modernism. We've even got a map of over 4,000 houses you can use to drive around and look. Sound fun? You're welcome. We want to assure that every modernist house has someone in the wings waiting for it to become available. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by Diane Bald and the Budman family. Restoring significant architecture in Toronto, Los Angeles, Malibu, and Palm Springs. It's autumn in New York when the city moves into prime time for tourists, sunset photos, the end of rooftop parties, and the Architecture and Design Film Festival, or ADFF, headed up by returning podcast guest Kyle Bergman. Kyle founded the ADFF in New York in 2008, and he now hosts versions of it all over the world. ADFF seeks out films with impassioned human stories that appeal to both architects and the general design-loving public. The New York ADFF starts up Thursday, October 12th. Welcome back, Kyle. Thanks. Great to be back. And love what you guys have been doing with the podcast over the years. It's just amazing. Oh, thank you, Kyle. And you've been just putting together these wonderful events, which are now all over the planet. Tell us about what's coming up in architecture for the October New York Film Festival. Coming up this year, it's hard to believe it's our 15th anniversary of the Architects and Design Film Festival. Amazing. When I, when I first started, I thought it was just going to be one off, one and done, and no idea that we'd still be at it this long. So it, we're really excited. And I think it's an exceptional lineup of films this year. We have an opening night film called Modernism, Inc., and it's the Elliot Noyce story. And what's great about it, it really talks about before brands branded themselves or thought about everything design conscious for a certain company or how it looked, he was thinking about everything design related to IBM. And it really puts him, I think, at this point, kind of before Apple was Apple, Elliot Noyes made IBM a design conscious brand. And it's this amazing story. I mean, it looks at how we think about brands today. 
early on. It's super, super interesting. And one of the films you have routinely mentioned in interviews when asked about what makes an architecture film work is My Architect, about Louis Kahn, and that's coming back with a new update. Yeah, so it's 20 years since My Architect was made. So I started thinking about the Architecture and Design Film Festival in 2000, and in 2003, when I saw that film, I realized what the sweet spot should be for the films for the festival. And it, what it has is, as an architect and architects, we love it because it's a film about Lou Kahn. It's so interesting. But the general public got into it. And the reason why it became nominated for an Oscar for a documentary was it's just a son's search for his father. And that's such a human story. And it's such a, you know, such a story that anyone can relate with. And the film is just, it's so good. I saw it recently in a movie theater about four months ago, and it holds up so well. It's just, it is truly a classic. And we're really excited to be showing it. And the director, Nathaniel Kahn, will be there for a Q&A after the screening. And even if you've seen it before, to see it again on the big screen, it's so amazing. The panorama of his father's work is still breathtaking today. It is. And what's great is you have all these people that Nathaniel interviewed 20 years ago. And unfortunately, most of them are no longer with us anymore, except for a few. People like Doshi and Philip Johnson and so many amazing people. So to hear those people giving their perspectives on Khan is, is great to see again. Kyle, where can people buy tickets for this event? So all the tickets are sold online through our website, which is adfilmfest.com. And you can buy tickets for the New York Festival. And then eventually we take the festival this fall to Toronto, Vancouver, and Chicago. And so you'll be able to get tickets for those cities if you happen to be in those cities. U.S. Marnish Radio will have interviews with a number of these filmmakers uh, later on in the spring. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks, George. Keep up the good work. Researcher and space architect Melody Yishar has been designing for space exploration for years, first as the co-founder of the Search Plus Space Exploration Architecture, and now as VP for Building Design and Performance at ICON, a firm devoted to developing advanced construction. Their 3D-printed houses in the largest such neighborhood in the U.S. went on sale this past June. Born and raised in L.A., Melody has a B.A. from Berkeley. Go Golden Bears! Studied human-computer interaction at Carnegie Mellon. Go Tartans! And architecture at Columbia. Go Lions! And was a senior research associate in the Human-Computer Interaction Lab at NASA Ames Research Center. Where, in fact, it is all rocket science. <laughs> Her latest project with ICON is the Mars Dune Alpha, a 3D-printed Mars habitat, designed in collaboration with Bjarke Ingels. To be built at NASA's Johnson Space Center. You know, in Houston, where they solve problems. Welcome, Melody. Hi. Great to be with you. Melody, what came first for you? Was it a passion for space or a passion for design? Uh, the passion for design and technology and also thinking about space as the final frontier for humanity, it, it really all evolved around the same time. I always knew that I wanted to be working at the intersection of design and technology. To me, space represents the ultimate kind of confluence of all the problems that we need to be resolving in science, research, and technology to get to this new frontier. Were you a sci-fi fan at all growing up? I was. I was a sci-fi fan growing up. Uh, but more than anything, I was interested in how we can enable people to live for long durations in space and also thinking about what exactly that means for us, having an off-world presence in space, how it's going to change humanity, both anthropologically but also sociologically. I was interested in these big ideas, and space architecture became how I sort of conveyed and expressed those ideas relative to uh, some of the important problems NASA is working on today. I'm guessing you saw The Martian more than one time. I've seen The Martian. I've only seen it once, actually. Okay. I mean, because that was all about the problems of living, right, on a planet. And growing potatoes. Yeah. That's right. So what have we learned about long-term life in space? Have we learned some more about that in the last few years? 
Yeah, absolutely. So the best example, or let's say the most relevant example for humans living for long durations in space is, of course, the International Space Station, Mm -hmm. the space station that's orbiting Earth right now. And we don't have any better kind of precedent or research or, or active project evaluating or looking into how people will live for long durations in orbit or on the surface of the moon and Mars. But I really look to space architecture and the space architecture community to put a vision for what future life living and working on the surface of these planets might be like. It's a fantastic reference point that is both inspirational to others, but also is a way to accelerate our thinking for the most salient problems on the technology side that need to be resolved to get us there. What other countries have gone to the moon besides the U.S.? Um, Israel has gone to the moon. China has gone to the moon. Research on the moon has been uh, prolonged for, for many decades. And of course, the Apollo missions were the last time where we actually had boots on the moon and we were doing lots of orbital kind of research and imaging on the geology and topography of the moon. So a lot of the data and the science that we have relative to the moon dates back to those Apollo missions. So it's really exciting now that the Artemis program is is basically up and running and uh, Artemis 1 took flight not too long ago, and uh, we're gearing up towards Artemis II. It's really exciting that we're going to have boots on the moon again fairly soon, the first woman on the moon. It's really a new kind of era for space flight and thinking about human exploration on uh, the moon and eventually Mars. Have you ever wanted to go out to be an astronaut? You know, I, I have always wanted to visit the ISS. I think I would go on a, on a lunar mission in a heartbeat. I would think twice, though, about a Mars mission. I'm not so sure if I can commit to that, given the number of unknowns that there are currently relative to missions to Mars. And it takes a long time to get there. Yeah. It takes a long time. We don't have warp drive yet, Scotty. <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> when are we going to see more of space tourism, do you think, where people can go up in a plane and orbit That's just a regular thing like they go to Disney World? Oh, space tourism is uh, is a thriving industry now more than ever before. The commercial sector in particular is uh, very interested and invested in creating these opportunities for future civilian astronauts and space tourists. We're going to be seeing things like lunar flybys and short stay missions around the moon in the next several years. And of course, in uh, low Earth orbit, the ISS will be replaced by uh, a number of commercial space stations that are being developed in the private sector. And space tourism and research is going to be a huge element of that. Yeah, the ISS is getting kind of old now, isn't it? Yes, the ISS is set to be decommissioned, unfortunately. But it, again, it is opening up new possibilities for the commercial sector to step in and uh, introduce an entirely new economy in low Earth orbit. What do you do with an ISS? I mean, do you send it back into the atmosphere and burn it up like happened to Skylab 30-some years ago, or do you try to recover it and keep it intact? It's a really good question. In fact, I have been thinking about how we might introduce a kind of like general solicitation or like open question as a competition to the public for what to do when we decommission ISS. The current plan as it stands is that it will literally fall into the ocean when it gets decommissioned. It will just fall from the sky and into the ocean. But it will be a controlled fall uh, as opposed to some of those Chinese rockets that just randomly (laughs) fall to earth and we hope nobody gets hit. Yeah. Ours will be aimed, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. It it will be a a planned and highly intentional fall, yes. Tell us, Melody, about ICON's project in Texas. This 3D neighborhood has been in the works for several years now. Most people have heard of 3D printing houses. They've seen videos on YouTube. But my first question to you is, what is the goo that is in 3D printing? What is that stuff they're squirting out to build the houses? (laughs) The goo. The goo that is uh, running through the nozzle and being deposited by the printer 
is basically a mortar-based cementitious material that we've engineered specifically to run through the nozzle and be deposited by the printer. It's a combination of multiple, let's say, elements and priorities when we engineer that material. So we're interested in the flowability of that goo to get down the, down the hose, so to speak, and also the viscosity of that goo to make sure that we're creating enough structural stability for one layer to go down and then another layer to be deposited right on top of it. So is it a quick dry kind of thing? Like once it hits the air, it starts to solidify? Yeah, it cures when it hits the air, absolutely. I would say that the times are quite comparable to traditional concrete materials. But timing has got to be critical. I guess you can't squirt it out too slowly or too quickly, otherwise you'll wind up with a mess. So precision counts. That's yeah. absolutely right. Precision counts. This is a highly precise operation that we've got going on here between uh, the material handling system and then what is actually deposited by the nozzle. We do have lift times to consider when we're moving from one layer of the so-called layer cake to the next. And uh, all of it is highly planned and uh, engineered so that uh, we're actually achieving the kind of structural performance that matters to us. And I've seen in this last year or so, they're actually doing 3D roofs as well that are these circular kinds of patterns of the goo just slightly building on each other until it forms an apex at the top. That's pretty neat. Yeah, we are actively developing a research program that we refer to as domes, arches, and vaults. And it's these kinds of new and, well, I, sh I shouldn't say they're new, but it's these kinds of freeform in organic geometries that, you know, harken back even to the Renaissance that we're able to accomplish using 3D printing, which you can't necessarily do with traditional rectilinear materials and methods of construction. You can't really build a dome or an arch or a vault as easily, efficiently, or as timely as you can with, with 3D printing. So we're leaning into that. We're leaning into the fact that wood and wood stick frame and steel construction just doesn't allow for the kind of variability that you get with these new geometries and 3D printing. So what are these houses in Austin going to look like, the ones you're building outside of town? Yeah, so we have a 100-home development that we are working on with Lennar, the production scale builder. And it is uh, about 45 minutes north of Austin. These homes have been designed in collaboration with the Bjarke Ingalls Group. And we have a collection of eight floor plans that we've introduced with a number of facade and finish options relative to each floor plan. And to our knowledge, it is the only 3D printed community in the world. And uh, we're very excited that these houses are now for sale. And um, yeah, it will be the first true introduction of a development scale project to the world that has been fully 3D printed. How long will it take to build one of these houses? So let's say a 2,000 square foot house takes about two weeks to 3D print. And then the houses are finished traditionally, and that can range between six to eight months, depending on who we're working with and uh, who the general contractor is. Very often, ICON will perform the full build for our structures, so we act as a design builder. In other instances, we are a subcontractor to uh, other builders. It must be really fascinating to go out there and watch these 3D printers go. And I understand you're going to have a version of these machines that you want to take to Mars to build, I believe, using the soil. Is that right? That's correct. So uh, we have been working with NASA in the last several years to develop additive manufacturing technologies for space for both the moon and eventually on Mars. The principle being that one of the most sustainable ways to create habitats and other kinds of civil and engineering structures and infrastructure in space is not by launching them from Earth, but actually using the local and indigenous materials that are on the planet, so on the moon and on Mars, to create different types of structures and habitats for long-duration missions. I read it takes like 10,000 times the cost to bring something from Earth 
versus to use what you find on the planet? Uh, yeah, launch mass is very expensive. And so uh, one of the most, again, strategic decisions we can make is to restrict our payload capacity to the most essential resources that we need. And basically, instead of launching all of those facilities and infrastructure ourselves from Earth, send an additive manufacturing robot, just a single system that can go up there, scoop the material, process the material, handle it, and then use it to create a whole range of infrastructure, starting from things like roads to landing pads to unpressurized hangars and then eventually habitats that are certified for human occupancy. So it's a job for a robot. Yeah. I figured. Oh, yeah. Will they let us in once they're finished (laughs) building the place? I don't know, Tom. I think they're probably going to keep it for themselves. They might. You know, it's a good question. Actually, we get asked a lot if this is all planned to be done by robots, what exactly will the role of people or humans be in the long term in space when we're talking about construction activities and building habitats and that type of thing? I'm confident that as soon as people land on the surface of the moon and Mars, that people are also going to be working with robots to build these structures. It's inevitable. I see that as a as a definite future for us. And so there certainly will be potential for an extraterrestrial construction workforce to uh, t- to take place. So the robots will greet us as liberators. Yes, I exactly. Okay. And you know, Tom, they'll open up an <laughs> Ikea somewhere on the moon <laughs> that you can run out and get some quick uh, do-it-yourself assembled furniture for right. your space hab. Right. There's a whole infrastructure to be built yeah. there. Melody, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thank you. It was a pleasure. German film director, producer, and writer Jan schmidt Gare got his start in opera and philosophy and then founded PARS Media, producing documentary and feature films on music and the arts. He's directed operas in Switzerland, Austria, and Germany, including most recently at the Leipzig Opera House. His latest film is The Promise, architect B.V. Doshi, an intimate portrait of the late architect's life and work as told by Doshi himself. Welcome, Jan. Good afternoon. Nice. Thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you for coming. Jan, you grew up in Munich in the 60s and 70s. Your, your mom was a theater critic, and your early work was in opera. How did you get attracted to opera? Oh, wow. Uh, that was very natural. I was always attracted to opera. I, I sang myself as, as a child. I was one of the boys in, in the magic flute, and I always listened to opera. So, yeah. The question would rather be, why not do operas? Ah, okay. It's been so long, you don't remember where you started with it? (laughs) Yes. Wow. And you've worked both in popular music and opera, right? Um, In popular music, not not so much, no. Okay. Mostly opera and and theater and film. Your latest film is a documentary titled The Promise, Architect B.V. Doshi. Doshi is not an architect that most non-architects know about, so... Tell us about him and his importance in the world. Well, he recently died at the age of 95. He was born in Pune in India, but he was from an Ahmedabad family, which is in the northwest of India. And he's an amazing architect of his own, but the people he worked with are also very interesting because he spent uh, four years in Paris in the studio of Le Corbusier. And Le Corbusier went with him to India to work on his Indian projects because he has built this capital of Chandigarh in India, which was a huge, huge project, one of the biggest projects in architectural history of the, the 20th century. And he did some very, very beautiful pieces in, in Ahmedabad, in Doshi's town. And that's where they worked together and where at the end Doshi stayed and started his own practice. And in his own practice, he did plenty of things. He did many, many universities, schools. In the, the, the early work looks a little bit like Corbusier. You feel the, the influence. But then he did, developed his own style, integrating nature in his buildings and doing social projects for poor people. And so maybe we, c- we can talk about that later. Very, very important architect with a huge body of work. 
Doshi was really ahead of his time in several areas, in sustainability and in social responsibility. Tell us about that. Well, yeah, that's a very, very important aspect of his work. He he did that so early because I, I always said he is 90, well, or when we started filming, he was 92, but he is still the youngest architect around because that's exactly what, what architecture students are talking about. Working with local materials, for instance, he, he did that already in the 60s, avoiding long, long transportation of, of material. And he was always very aware of uh, not using ACs, but using natural cooling systems, which is very important, of course, in, in a hot country like India. And for instance, one of his most beautiful early buildings is the Institute of Indology, which he conceived like a ship. And he said the, the bottom of the, the ship is is heavy and it has to be in the water, which is in the ground, in the earth. And that served as a natural cooling. And in this bottom of the ship, he had the, the important, the costly, precious documents that this Institute of Indology preserved. One of his most important projects was the Aranya housing development in Indora, one of his most exciting works. Yeah, that's maybe the the project that is most famous in his body of work. And maybe that's the reason he received the Pritzker Award, even though, of course, they give it for the entire body of work. Aranya was, it has an interesting story. Uh, Doshi was already quite famous then in India. That was in the early 80s, I think. And he was invited to a city called Indore, not too far from where Doshi lived, but in another state. And they said, Mr. Doshi, you have carte blanche. You can do whatever you want. I will drive you here around the city and you can choose a piece of land and do whatever you want. You can build a bank, you can build a theater, you can build a museum or whatever you want. And they drove around. There was a very, very big plot at the outskirts of the city. And Doshi asked, what is this? What are you planning here? They say, yeah, that's that's not really defined yet. We, it, It's going to be a social project, a housing project for poor people. And Doshi said, let, let me do that. They said, why, why do you want to do that? You, you, we, there's not a big budget for that. And it's not so att- attractive for you. And he said, no, no, this is exactly what I want to do. And he developed that project. And the idea was, it's still a revolutionary. He said, we don't have a big budget. So we will divide this property into small plots. And those plots will be given to people for free, to poor people from, from the slums. They did a lottery and, and those people could, could win uh, plots. And then on the plots, we will build a very, very basic structure, just some pipes that you need for water and and electricity and a few walls and a roof. And that's it. Very, very basic. And those buildings were conceived to be extended. So the, the inhabitants of these buildings were supposed to live with that and to go on building these buildings on their own. And Doshi has constructed, I think, 40 model houses that they would copy and then they were free to do whatever they wanted some copied them some did what what they wanted some added some ornamentation that Doshi would never have designed himself but that was part of the deal and so he said i want real life to take place here and i don't want to have this masterwork designed by the mastermind architect i want the community to develop this And that worked very well. And those people came from all parts of the country. So they spoke different languages. They came from different religious backgrounds. And normally those people wouldn't go along together very well. But because they had this building project together, they needed to help each other to to support each other. One would supply this kind of material. Others would be fit in this. And so the, this community became like a big family, and they still are, and it's very big in the meantime. And all these people developed very beautifully out of out of this project. And this was in the 70s, correct? Maybe it was 76. And I believe now there are something like 80,000 people there? Oh, wow. Yeah, it's it's a real big city. Very impressive. And when you travel through it, you still see the, the original or the early building. And then you see some buildings that have changed entirely. Some people, of course, get, got richer than other ones. So they bought their neighbor's houses and, <laughs> and demolished them and built something big on, the, on a bigger plot as life develops. So this really seems like it was a huge success. It was. It was really a great, great project. Was the key to this giving people title to the small plots of land? Um, yes, that was key. And the openness of the structure 
if he had built the, the buildings all by himself, there wouldn't have been enough money and and it would have been much smaller. And as he used the money this way, many more people could benefit from it. You got to know him very well during the course of the documentary. What was he like? He was very generous with his time, with everything, extremely generous, very kind, very good sense of humor, and very curious. So, you know, in film, when you have a good DOP... A director of photography? Yeah. There are many, many moments where you have to wait. My DOP has built his his light very carefully, and that took hours. And Doshi was always early, or he didn't even want to leave between scenes. So he had to wait. He had to, had to wait one, two, three hours. And he was never bored because he's so curious. He sat on a chair in the middle of the of the set and watched the technicians do their work, and he enjoyed it. And I think this is very, very characteristic for him. I think he was like that all his life long, and that's why he was still in, in mental health and why he was happy, basically. Did Doshi do any projects outside of India? Not a single one. So it was really important that his expertise got recognized by the Pritzker. Definitely, of course. That gave his, his reputation a big, big booster. But he was famous also in other countries because he taught a lot. So that was his second life. He was a professor everywhere on earth. He taught in Hong Kong and in Europe and a lot in uh, Philadelphia. Oh, I'm not sure. In the States. Uh, uh, but it's the city where also uh, Louis Kahn taught and where they met. I think it was in Philadelphia. Right. Penn, yeah, at, at the University of Pennsylvania. And oh, Philadelphia, yes. yeah. yeah. You had it right. You had it right. When Doshi passed away, I assume a lot of people were wanting to remember him and celebrate his life. That's true. I'm, I don't know exactly what happened because I wasn't in India. I couldn't come to his funeral. Uh, but I received many, many uh, messages and posts on Instagram, etc., et from, from people mourning him. He had a very, very, very big following. So he founded an architectural university in Ahmedabad called CEPT, C-E-P-T, uh, Central of Environmental Planning and Technology or something like that. And he taught there for more than 50 years. And when we visited together, because he wanted to, to show it, he also built the building and he wanted to show the building to us and explain all his ideas about an architectural university that was like an Indian version of Bauhaus. Um, they didn't know that we were coming, the, the faculty and, and students. So we just showed up. And then I would say 500 students showed up from every corner of the city to be there with him. And, and the, it was totally crowded. We could almost not get through the building because they all adored him. And then at the end, we were all sitting uh, outside and they built a big, 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 big wall of people around him. Wow. Uh, who just wanted to see Bibi Doshi. Sounds like a pop star to me. He was. Absolutely. He was a rock star. When we walked to, uh, through the city, it was really like a pop star. There were people taking pictures with, with him, uh, having him s sign autographs, etc. He was a big star in India, especially, of course, in his hometown. Doshi was awarded the Pritzker Prize in 2018, not that long ago. And the movie is The Promise, Architect B.V. Doshi. Thanks so much for joining us, Jan. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for listening. U.S. Marnish Radio is underwritten by Diane Bald and the Budman family, restoring significant architecture in Toronto, Los Angeles, Malibu, and Palm Springs. Okay, Tom, I pass the puck to you. He shoots, he scores. <laughs> Visit usmodernist.org's massive archives to listen to past shows, discover documentation of 20,000 significant modernist houses, and access 4.2 million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song was performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl with Kelly Policelli on guest research. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Modernist Archive Incorporated, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation preservation and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm Tom Guild. George and I will be back soon with another Rockstar Architecture edition of U.S. Modernist Radio. Mm -hmm.